My name is Lisa McManus. I am a postdoc in Malin Pinsky's lab over at the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Natural Resources. And today I'll be talking about network structure and adaptive potential in coral meta communities. So many organisms inhabit patches, uh, inhabit discrete patches within a spatially continuous matrix. Um, and this is usually due to either behavioral, physiological, or ecological constraints of the organism, but it can also be due to uh, human-induced fragmentation. Um, dispersal networks influence the dynamics and persistence of spatially structured communities. Um, and for most, or for many marine organisms such as corals and reef fish, um, when I talk about dispersal networks, I'm really focusing on the larval dispersal stage since for these organisms, that is when they travel the farthest during their lifetime. And for my talk today, I'll be talking about how the network structure of uh, larval dispersal affects both ecological and evolutionary processes, processes that affect the adaptive potential of spatially structured communities. So communities can adapt through both ecological and evolutionary processes. Um, in terms of ecology, uh, I'll be talking a lot about competition, specifically inter-specific competition. Um, so in terms of that, you can think of a coral community being able to persist uh, at a particular patch because species that are better adapted to that particular environment are able to outcompete the resident species. Um, in terms of evolutionary processes, such as local adaptation, uh, individuals within a species or a population that are better adapted will be favored and may be able to persist because of the effects of natural selection. So most studies consider either only ecological or evolutionary processes when they're thinking about the adaptive potential of organisms. However, in 2012, Norberg et al. Uh, did a or performed a, a simulation study that incorporated the effects of both ecology and evolution. And they found that indeed both do mediate extinction risk. Okay, so their setup was that they had simulations on a linear set of patches across a latitudinal gradient. So at the ends of their network are cooler patches representing the poles and towards the middle um, are warmer patches to represent the equator. And so we see that on the x-axis of this figure, where we have cold patches at the end and hotter patches towards the center. They then performed temperature increase experiments. So uh, the, the system started off relatively cold and then got warmer through time up to this point over here, the dashed white line, where they then allowed temperature to plateau. And the colors here, so the purple color is the uh, it's the relative contribution of competition to the trait change at a patch, and the yellow represents the contribution of evolution. So they found that cold regions are dominated by competition. And if you think about the fact that some patches were already warmer, as the cooler patches were warming up, there already existed individuals or species that were able to colonize those cold patches and outcompete those that were already there. Now, since the warm regions were also getting warmer, there weren't any pre existing species or organisms that were already pre adapted to the warming conditions. So, in the warmer regions, um, these, were, these patches were dominated by local adaptation. Another interesting result is that they found that though the ecological response was faster, the evolutionary response has a longer duration as you can see by the yellow. Uh, and even evolution even has an effect beyond when temperature was increasing, as you can see by the yellow patch kind of going over the dashed white line. Another cool study found that dispersal can alter our estimates of thermal tolerance. So in Claypus et al., they, uh, they looked at the coral triangle region in the Indo-Pacific, and they found that if you incorporate dispersal, this really affects our understanding of what the thermal stress threshold of each patch within that system is. So again, they calculated bleaching thresholds across the coral triangle. That was their first step. 
And this was simply based on uh, historical sea surface temperatures. I just want to point out that this study had no evolution or competition, and they were purely looking at the effects of incorporating dispersal patterns. So this is the first plot. So this is just showing that the, the cooler sites are uh, historically, have historically experienced cooler temperatures, where the warmer colored sites have experienced relatively warmer temperatures. So again, this is purely based on sea surface temperature at a particular site. They then incorporated dispersal, which, um, which was based off of ocean circulation models coupled with some Lagrangian particle tracking. And they then saw how relative to the first plot, the estimates for bleaching tolerance changed. So some patches shown in red experienced an increase in their tolerance and some sites shown in blue incre uh, showed a decrease in their thermal tolerance. And this is just based off of the traits at your particular source reefs. If you're a destination reef, you're not only, you're probably retaining some of your own larvae, so you have that trait that's based off of the first plot, but you must also take into account the traits of the larvae that you are receiving. And that's what the final plot is showing. So just putting some of these ideas together, I really wanted to look at how network structure affects the relative contribution of ecology and evolution to the adaptive capacity of coral populations and really any spatially structured population. And what I mean in this sense, in terms of network structure, um, is based on a framework created by Watts and Strogatz. So in what they call a regular network, you're connected to an arbitrary number of your nearest neighbors. So in my system, um, each patch is connected to its four nearest reefs. But then if you decide to have a rewiring probability for each of those links, if you if you make it such that the rewind probability is one so that every link has 100% chance of being changed, you end up with a random network. So now you're connected to still the same number of patches, but they can be very close or very far away. And in between these two, we have what are called small world, uh, small world networks, which I won't be discussing today, but in terms of, so today I'll just be showing results for the regular and random network, but in terms of the work I've done, I can see that the small world network kind of shows result that, results that fall in between the two. Okay, so there are some studies that um, have used this framework, um, in particular for the ecological sense. So Holland and Hastings had a study where they had the same framework, so from regular to random, and they had predator-prey dynamics occurring on all their patches, and uh, both of those dispersed with some probability across the network. And what they found was that on regular networks, um, the dynamics are highly synchronous across the patches, which leads to larger abundance fluctuations and therefore a higher risk for extinction. So what they found was that random networks were more persistent overall. And you can think of it this way. So if you're on a particular patch and you have some sort of oscillatory dynamics, when you're at a low point, you might be hoping that you receive an influx of individuals or larvae from somewhere else, and you're hoping that other patches are at a high point maybe to be able to give you those individuals. But if you're all experiencing the cycle at the same time, if you're at a low point and it's highly synchronous, then everywhere else is at a low point, and so the chance for recovery is much lower. So basically, random networks should do better based on this work. The predictions for evolution are much more uh, confusing and are basically like, it can help or it can hurt, right? Just like we saw in the Claypus work, um, some of those reefs did get a beneficial larvae that were more adapted to higher temperatures. But on some of those patches, you're receiving an influx of maladapted larvae that are, that are not necessarily detrimental, or sometimes they can be. Sometimes you can get what's known as gene swamping, where you have this influx of, of larvae or of individuals that are not adapted to the environment and can actually lower the overall fitness there. So in terms of ecological dynamics, random networks are good. 
in terms of evolution, could go either way. So this is our modeling framework. So uh, I have 20 reefs, and they're all connected by the dispersal of coral larvae. So this is what my 20 reefs look like. It's on a bit of an environmental gradient. So on the top are the hotter reefs, and at the bottom are the cooler reefs. And, uh, and at the beginning of the simulation, uh, all species are adapted to the initial temperature at that patch. On each reef, there are two coral functional groups and a macroalgae competitor. So coral one is fast growing with a narrow temperature tolerance and coral two is slow growing with a wider temperature tolerance. So we can visualize that by looking at this plot. So there's temperature on the X axis and growth rate on the Y axis. So the orange curve is species one. So its maximum growth rate is a lot higher, but it can only survive in a narrow range. Whereas species two has an overall slower growth rate, but it can persist over a wider range of temperatures. And then uh, we allow the temperature to increase sigmoidally, uh, mostly during the first 200 years, and then we kind of allow it to plateau a bit, and we run the model for 500 years in total. So the temperature is increasing across all the patches. There are two main equations in this model. So there are a set of differential equations, and the first one looks at the change in abundance of each species at each, at each patch. So this depends on the population dynamics at a patch, so that's growth, mortality, which both depend on temperature, and also competition among the species. Uh, then it also depends on the genetic load, which is the difference between uh, the average trait of the species at a patch and the optimum trait at a patch. And finally, we're also taking into account, into account dispersal from all the other patches or the patches that they're connected to. We're also tracking the change in trait of each species at each patch. And the trait we're working on here is the optimal growth temperature. Okay, so this depends on directional selection. Again, uh, natural selection favors individuals that are more closely matched to their environment. So if the temperature, if the optimal growth temperature of species one is 27 degrees and the patch is at 27 degrees, it'll grow really, really fast. But any deviation from that will start to cause a slowdown. And finally, we're not only keeping track of how many individuals enter a patch, we're also keeping track of the trait of those individuals that come into the patch. So that can change the, the dynamics as well. The two aspects that I'm really going to focus on are genetic variance and system openness, which I'm gonna go over right now. So genetic variance is a measure of the amount of raw material evolution has to work with. So the more different, uh, the more, for example, um, traits or different alleles that are present within a population, the stronger the effect of evolution. Because you can imagine that the higher the genetic variance, the more likely it is that there is already a, a pre-adapted individual to that particular environment. And we can also think of a system where there is low genetic variance, where it's a relatively homogeneous population. And so I'll be talking about open versus closed systems. And so this is a connectivity matrix view of a regular network. So I have my origin sites on the x-axis and my destination sites on the y-axis. So what this is saying is that in my open system, uh, I retain my larvae and I also give larvae to the four nearest reefs around me. And in this case, it's all equal amounts. In a closed system, we only have local retention. So in a perfectly closed system, the reef is keeping all of its larvae. Um, and today I'll be showing you an open system and a system that is not fully closed, but almost completely closed. So mostly local retention with a little bit of dispersal to other places. Okay, so now I'll be showing you the results for the final total coral cover after the end of the temperature increase experiments. The higher coral covers here will be in this peach color and then low coral cover will be in black. Uh, 
Um, I have a range of open to closed systems on the x-axis and, oops, additive genetic variants, hopefully, on the y-axis. Okay. All right, yeah, I wasn't gonna try to explain this in words. Um, so for the, for the most part, there's a large parameter space where uh, coral cover is very high, 100%, in fact. So that's the regular network. So as genetic variance goes up, so the results here, um, that it's, it's really driven by genetic variance. There is a bit of an effect with how open and closed the system is, but for the most part, um, as long as evolution or genetic variance is high enough, coral cover uh, becomes very high. In a random network, we see uh, more of an interaction between our two parameters. Um, and in general, the parameter space over which coral, is, coral cover, combined coral cover is maximum, is much less. So that's our first effect. And remember, based on ecological work, uh, we expected random networks to do better. So what's going on here? So now, so that was total coral cover. Now I wanna look at each of my coral groups separately. So now the colors go yellow for very high and uh, dark purple for very low. This is species one for the regular network. And if you remember what our regular graph looked like previously, this almost maps completely onto it. Because look, coral two is just dead in these simulations. So this is for the regular network. In the random, random network, we see that there's, um, there's certainly a lot of coexistence here. So species one tends to do well in random networks when there's relatively higher genetic variance, whereas coral two does pretty well here. And I have some ideas of why that is, and we'll go through them in a bit, okay. So another cool aspect of this model is that you can, uh, you can take the average trait value, the change in the average trait value, so this combines both coral groups, and you can partition how that trait value is changing into both ecological and evolutionary components. So here, Z sub I is the optimal trait value of species I, and P sub I is the relative proportion of species I. So in the first component in the blue, this is how the proportion of species is changing relative to its trait value. And in the second part, it's how the trait is changing relative to the proportion of the species. And we can track this through time. And this is just to show you, I'm gonna show you results for uh, a system that has intermediate genetic variance, but is very open, okay? So first results for the open system. So, I have the contribution of ecology in blue, and I'll have the contribution of evolution in red. And I'll have regular networks on top and random networks on the bottom. So this is when I average everything across all reefs. We can see that we have e evolution and ecology are kind of happening in both, especially during that temperature increase period, which is within the first 200 years. This is only now the hot reefs. So now it's slightly more interesting because we're seeing that in regular networks, the hot reefs are purely experiencing evolutionary contribution, while in the random network, it's mostly ecological. And now if we look at the cold reefs, they kind of have a similar signature for both regular and random network. Um, but certainly in the regular network, it's very strong for the first couple hundred years whereas in the random network, it still persists a little bit through time. Okay, so remember that was the open system and now I'm gonna show you results from a closed system with still the same amount of genetic variance. Okay, so same thing, this is for averaged across all reefs. So we can see that only, it's only evolution that's occurring in the regular network Whereas in the random network, there's a very, very strong contribution of ecology, or competition rather. So the hot reefs look exactly the same in the regular network, 
And actually, interestingly, in the random network, there seems to just be like a relatively low contribution from each. And then in the cold reefs, again, looks exactly the same in the regular network, but it's an even stronger uh, competition component in the random network for the cold reefs. So what's happening here? We can take a look at the individual trajectories at each reef. So on the right there, that's just uh, the previous plots that I showed earlier. So again, this is for an open system and I'm showing results for a regular network. This is how the percent cover through time changes between uh, changes among a regular, uh, the coral species one and coral species two. So we can see that coral species two kind of persists for a little bit in the colder regions, but uh, eventually becomes outcompeted completely by species one. And this is just how the trait value is changing. Um, and this is just to show that in general, there is always a slight push towards increasing that. Um, unfortunately, so you can see here, uh, there really shouldn't be anything more past this point, but I'm still trying to figure out a way to represent that clearly. So in the model, uh, there's no real zero extinction. It's just at very low levels. And so that's why there's still a trait value, even though they're functionally extinct. So now if we look at the random network in the open system, we see that species two persist for a bit longer, but it is still eventually outcompeted. Um, and in general, the blue or the cold sites do very well here. And I'm mostly showing this just so we can match up what's going on with the trajectories as well as the ecological evolutionary contributions. And what's basically happening is that when both coral one and coral two exist, you see that signature of ecological or uh, competition contribution. Whereas as soon as it's only one of them left, that's when evolution starts acting. So this is just both of them combined. And as I mentioned earlier, in open networks, coral one uh, usually eventually outcompetes coral two. So that was the results for the open system. And now I'm gonna talk about our closed system. So this is a regular network. And remember, this was, uh, these were the plots where there was only an evolutionary contribution. And that's because coral one just immediately takes over. And if you think about how the model is structured, this makes sense. So, uh, so coral one grows very fast if it's within its optimal range. Right, and so since you're not having an influx of other traits, it's really just relying on that uh, genetic variance, that evolution component, and it's able to quickly take over. Um, so again, this is how the trait value is increasing. When in a regular network, when the system is completely closed, they're basically acting as just individual patches. Um, and then in terms of the random network, we get really interesting dynamics. So remember, these were the plots with the significant ecological or competition contribution, and that's because both of these species are able to persist. And the reason I think that coral species two does well in the random network is because you have those long distance dispersal events. So, if you're species one and you're just dispersing to your nearby patches, those nearby patches are likely to be within the range of the, the, that skinny but tall curve that we showed for optimal growth, right? So it's more likely to be able to outcompete species two. It's likely to be able to persist. However, when you have long distance events, you now go out of the range um, over which coral one can grow. And that is when coral two can finally can finally shine, it can finally outcompete it, at least for a little while. Um, and it even does seem to be sustained in these trajectories. So again, in closed and random networks, coral two can persist, but in most of the parameter space I've explored, uh, coral one does definitely take over. There are a lot of ne next steps here. Um, I want to look at differences in degree distribution. So this is the number of patches you're connected to. I wanna see how that affects the results. Also, 
um, in terms of asymmetry. So right now, uh, the systems I've been looking at are perfectly symmetrical such that you give as much as you receive, at least in the regular network. Um, we're also applying this framework to regional case studies in Fiji, the Caribbean, and the Indo-Pacific, where we're using connectivity matrices from published work. And here we're looking at differences in marine protected area strategies and node removal experiments, and we can also track the eco-evolutionary contribution through time for these real systems. And finally, so uh, I showed that we have higher coral cover in regular networks, but there's coexistence in random networks, which is really interesting because the only trade-off we imposed is that optimal growth curve, just the width and the height, and there's a lot of other trade-offs, for example, in terms of competition with macroalgae. Some coral species are thought to be better competitors against macroalgae than others. And there's just a lot of other trade-offs we could have invoked to get coexistence, but turns out we didn't have to work too hard to get that. So in regular networks, evolution tends to dominate. Uh, species two is outcompeted, and we see that there's more, eco or more ecological contribution in random networks because there is the ability for coexistence and therefore competition. And it's really all due to, this gro to these growth curves um, that we see this pattern. And I just want to thank our funding, uh, my collaborators in the Pinsky Lab, and of course, uh, the department. Thank you. Maybe I'll take, are there any, maybe I'll take a couple questions while we switch over. Oh, yes? Oh, were you not raising your hand? Well, we, no, no, sorry. Okay, sorry, Zoe. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the justification for your species one and your species two? Are those two like common comparisons that like, you can demonstrate that they're really similar? Yeah. Or are they like, yeah, definitely. Um, there was a big paper, uh, really, really highly cited by Emily Darling in 2012, I think, where she kind of classified corals into different groupings. So there was, but there were many levels. So she could, she could do with two, for example, this competitive versus stress tolerant, or she could do kind of three or four. Um, and th this is based on, um, I think, work that was originally done with plants, uh, clustering them in terms of life history traits. So that's where we're basing this grouping on. So just like a vague, a vague grouping of fast growing, but not stress tolerant versus the other one. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, thank you everyone.
great. So uh, to start, uh, uh, I'd like to say, say a little about uh, how I end up uh, talking about this work here. So um, uh, I started uh, work, uh, work working at uh, Rutgers uh, started from February. Uh, I worked with uh, Paul Fokowski and Bob Cobb on the uh, global biogeochemical cycles uh, as well as the uh, Earth's uh, uh, system modeling. And uh, uh, we were uh, particularly interested in the great oxidation event. Uh, specifically, we were interested in why the uh, rise in atmospheric o oxygen occurred hundreds of mi millions of years after the uh, uh, the e emergence of cyanobacteria. So uh, one day, uh, Paul, uh, Wan, and me uh, sat down for a discussion and uh, uh, um, about the delay in the oxygenation. And one uh, su suggested that to look into the effect of uh, biological e e evolution on the rise in atmospheric uh, oxygen. So uh, one uh, re recommended a paper to me, uh, which is the uh, paper by John Norberg in 2012, published on Nature Climate Change, which also appeared in Lisa's uh, slides. So I read that paper, and uh, I want to test the method presented in that paper in the a uh, very simple Earth system model. So the simplest model came into my mind was the Daisy World model. So I uh, wrote a Python code for it and uh, did a few uh, simulations. Uh, so uh, th this work is just a, off uh, a uh, offshoot of my main project here. Uh, but I think it would fit nicely into a short talk like this. Uh, so to start uh, to uh, introduce the concept of Daisy World, we have to start to understand uh, uh, the uh, planetary habitability. So uh, all life forms, as we knew it, uh, needs uh, liquid water, and uh, the uh, existence of liquid water on the planet's surface is mainly determined by. Uh, first, uh, the luminosity of its host uh, star, and uh, the other is the distance between the planet and the star. So uh, when the planet is uh, too c close to a star, uh, and uh, the t temperature would be too hot, and the ocean would boil away, so uh, you will have a world like uh, the Venus. And if the planet is too far away from the star, it receives too little sunlight, and the temperature would be too, too cold. And the water would uh, exist only in ice form, uh, uh, like the present day Mars. Uh, so on Mars, ice can, can only be found uh, under the soil. And uh, when the planet's distance to the star is uh, just uh, right that uh, li liquid water can exist on its surface, then the, we call uh, that planet is habitable. And uh, we say the uh, range of the distance between a planet and uh, its star uh, that allows the e existence of liquid water on its surface is the habitable zone. And uh, it's also called the Goldilocks zone that the uh, planet, if the planet stays in this zone, uh, this zone, its temperature would uh, be ne neither too hot nor too cold, but just right for the uh, life forms. And uh, so, uh, but uh, now we have a problem here. So. Uh, be, because um, uh, the sun's brightness actually changes over time. So uh, when uh, hydrogen I atoms are fused into helium uh, in the core of the sun, uh, 
uh, the core density would increase and that would cause the core to heat up. And uh, so o over time, the brightness of the sun increases. In, in other words, uh, in the past, the sun was dimmer. So, but uh, uh, there are um, but plenty of evidence uh, suggesting that uh, li uh, liquid water uh, existed on Earth uh, about uh, 3.8 billion years ago, and the life uh, ha has been on Earth since about 3.5 billion years ago. But, uh, e uh, but uh, uh, a stellar evolution model would uh, predict that uh, during that time, the luminosity of the sun was actually uh, only about 70% as bright as, uh, as it, it is now. So, uh, and uh, uh, climate models uh, would show that uh, if you only decrease the solar flux by uh, 6% and keep other things unchanged, the Earth would fall into a global uh, frozen state called the snowball Earth. And so the question is how Earth has remained habitable for over 3.5 billion years. Uh, so geolo geologists and the geochemists uh, sometimes re resort to the mechanism called the silicate weathering uh, thermostat to explain the climate stability of over geologic time. The, me the me mechanism works like this. So CO2 is pumped into the atmosphere by volcanic outgassing. And uh, it's removed by the uh, weathering of uh, silicate rocks on land. And then it will, will de de deposit uh, onto the ocean floor as uh, carbonate rocks. And uh, perhaps it would uh, subduct it to the, uh, uh, deep into the mantle. And uh, there, the carbonate, uh, carbonate uh, rocks would be heated up and release uh, CO2 back into the atmosphere. So when, the, when you give a uh, per perturbation to the system and let like, the temperature to rise, and the uh, rainfall rate would uh, e increase and the weathering rate of silicate rocks on land would also increase. And that would uh, pull more CO2 from the air and uh, drop draw down the CO2 level in the atmosphere. And uh, because CO2 is a greenhouse gas, so that would help to cool the uh, planet back to normal. So this, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a geologist, I'm not quite sure how well this hypothesis has been tested uh, against uh, observational data, but uh, others have looked into the e effect of life uh, it, itself on, the, on uh, maintaining a habitable planet. So the uh, idea about the co-evolution of organisms on Earth has a long history. It's dated back uh, to, the, uh, to the 1700s to uh, the British geologist James Hutton to the uh, German naturalist Alexander von Humboldt and also to the, and more recently to the Ukrainian geochemist uh, uh, Vl Vladimir uh, Vernatsky. And, uh, but the m most uh, re recent pro proposition of the, uh, uh, c uh, came from the British scientist James Lovelock and uh, later joined by the American uh, evolutionary uh, biologist Lynn Margulis. And that, uh, it's named after the Greek uh, goddess uh, Gaia. And uh, uh, it was proposed in the 1970s. Uh, it uh, represented a major step forward compared to the earlier uh, wor uh, work uh, on the co-evolution of uh, organism and the Earth, because it proposed that the living matter, the air, the oceans, and the, the land surface were all parts of a giant system, uh, which was able to c control its temperature, as, as well as uh, a lot of other things. And, uh, and the, 
I think uh, emphasis should go here that it uh, says uh, so on uh, so as to be optimum for the survival of the biosphere. So um, after the uh, 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 inception of, of this hypothesis, it received much criticism uh, from the scientific uh, community. Um, many would uh, uh, argue that it, uh, uh, it cannot be called a hypothesis because it proposes no uh, t testable uh, uh, things. Uh, so, uh, so that uh, uh, the Gaia hypothesis is not uh, scientific. And to overcome this, uh, James Lovelock uh, collaborated with the British uh, biogeochemist chemist, uh, Andrew Watson. They uh, pu published a paper in 1983 uh, describing a imaginary world called the Daisy world. And uh, it's uh, uh, basically it just a, a mathematical or computer model, and uh, it would show that the uh, uh, there is a biological uh, homeostasis uh, on the global temperature. And uh, after the public uh, publication of the first paper, there were many uh, variants of the Daisy World model, and uh, the model could vary greatly in complex uh, complexity. And it can be zero dimensional, it can also be 1D or 2D. And uh, it can also vary uh, in the number of uh, species of daisies. And uh, they also, they are also different in the details of the physical laws. And uh, here we should build our own uh, daisy world model from scratch and uh, keep it, it uh, as simple as possible. So uh, here, my Daisy World model uh, is basically a pie in the sky. So uh, the world is flat. Uh, uh, so the Daisy World uh, receives energy from the sun, and it gets rid of uh, heat by e emitting infrared radiation to the space. Uh, just like uh, our uh, planet uh, Earth, uh, does. Uh, so the infrared radiation or the uh, outgoing long wave radiation is a linear function of the te temperature uh, of the surface. And the uh, energy the surface received from the sun uh, has to be, mul uh, so the net uh, energy flux has to be multiplied by the f factor here. Uh, so t to consider the uh, reflectivity of the sur surface. And uh, so the reflectivity is called albedo. Uh, in this daisy world, the uh, albedo of the bare, bare ground is only uh, 0 0.5. And uh, the daisy species can vary in colors so that, that they have different albedos. Uh, so uh, when you know the coverage, the spatial coverage of each uh, daisy species, you can get the uh, global mean uh, surface albedo. And then you can, uh, you can have the global mean surface temperature from the global energy balance equation. And two, uh, but the temperature uh, over each daisy species could be different from the global mean temperature because the <coughs> daisy uh, uh, beetle could be different from the, the global mean uh, beetle. So to consider the local energy ba balance equation, uh, we can get the uh, local temperature over each daisy species. And we also consider, uh, we also uh, assume that there are some uh, atmospheric circulations to move around heat so that the, uh, it would reduce the uh, temperature uh, in, in, uh, in homogeneity. And the 
uh, birth rate of the da daisy is, uh, is assumed to be a parabolic function of temperature, uh, of the uh, local temperature. So uh, all, for all daisy species, the optimum growth uh, temperature is uh, fixed at 20 degrees C. Uh, now we have the uh, equation for the birth rate of daisies and, and uh, subtract the, a, a, a constant mortality rate from it, we have the growth rate of uh, each daisy species. And, uh, so, and then we can have the uh, equation for the change in population in each daisy species, uh, which is uh, re uh, re re uh, represented by its uh, spatial coverage. Uh, first, uh, let's uh, so to uh, simulate the, the effect of a gradually brightening sun, uh, we can uh, so uh, in this set, set of uh, simulation, we can let the solar flux to increase uh, step by step slowly and uh, track the uh, daisy population as well as the uh, global mean temperature. And uh, first, uh, let's consider uh, we only have one daisy species that is gray in color, so that its albedo is the same as the bare ground. In this case, the, uh, in the fairly narrow range of solar flux, we have a daisy species that, uh, we, which can be seen here. This shows the fraction of the daisy pi covered by daisies. Uh, and uh, the global mean temperature is basically a linear function of the solar flux. Uh, now let's uh, introduce uh, a, a, one, a dark colored uh, daisy species in, into the model. And uh, we as assume that the albedo of the dark colored uh, da daisy is 0 0.25. Uh, first, uh, we let the solar uh, flux to increase slowly, and then at some point, we would uh, bring it uh, back down is, uh, to its uh, regional value. And the process of brightening sun is uh, represented by the blue uh, lines, and the process of the de dimming sun is by the red dashed lines. And here, we can see uh, several features. First, that the uh, lifespan of the biosphere is uh, pr prolonged during the process of uh, the dimming sun. That, uh, re remember that uh, this represented the uh, lifespan of the daisy world uh, with only one gray, uh, gray co colored daisy. And uh, the other thing is uh, there are, there are uh, hysteresis loops, uh, mean, meaning that the, uh, state, uh, the uh, state of the system is dependent uh, on its history. Uh, within the, with, with the solar flux uh, in this range, the daisy world can either be a lifeless world or it can be covered by daisies. And uh, also we can see that uh, as long as there is some uh, daisy uh, covering the pie, then uh, the, uh, the global mean temperature stays fairly uh, near the optimum growth temperature of the daisies. So uh, they, this is the uh, homeostasis uh, on global temperature. And we can also introduce one light colored daisy uh, to the daisy world model, which has an albedo of 0 0.75. That uh, uh, in this case, the uh, lifespan of the biosphere is greatly extended during the process of the brightening sun. And uh, we, as we can see that the, uh, now the uh, daisy exists uh, you know, fairly wide range of so, solar flux. And we can also see uh, hysteresis loops and uh, homeostasis on global mean temperature. Uh, 
and uh, we can add as many uh, number of these species to the model, and uh, now we have both a light and a dark colored daisies. Uh, and uh, here I only show the process of the brightening sun, and uh, we can see that the global mean temperature stays uh, fairly near the optimal growth temperature for a very large range of uh, solar flux. And uh, until now, our model, uh, though it's it uh, differs in some details with the uh, original Daisy World mo model by uh, Watson and Lovelock, published in 1983. Uh, uh, the sim simulations, uh, the results from those simulations uh, are quite similar to the original model. And, uh, as, and you can see they also show the simulation with a, uh, a gray uh, daisy species that has no effect on the environment, and also with a, a dark color, light color, and also two daisy species. And uh, <coughs> we can add uh, as many numbers of species to the model, but here it seems that diversity is not always good. Here, in this case, we have a uh, six number of daisy species, and uh, we see that the uh, lifespan of the biosphere is not as long as the case with on only two. Uh, so now we can consider this uh, imagine uh, uh, another uh, imaginary world. I call it the chameleon planet. Uh, so the planet uh, is is uh, governed by the same physical laws as the daisy world, but uh, it differs in that first it's uh, it's uh, 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 spherical in shape. The other is that its surface is covered by a mystical substance, which can vary color uh, with temperature, and so the albedo uh, of the planet of the planet's surface. Uh, has a temperature dependence like this. So at some point, uh, you would uh, expect the planet to be like this. So because the equator is warmer, uh, its uh, albedo perhaps was, uh, would be higher, so that it's brighter. And uh, we can also let the, uh, uh, yeah, and, uh, we can also let the solar flux to go up and down uh, for this uh, imaginary planet. And we can see that the uh, resulting uh, albedo and the global mean surface temperatures, uh, it has um, much uh, similarity to the daisy world model with, only, uh, with one uh, light colored daisy species. So uh, just uh, like that, uh, the Daisy World model, this uh, lifeless planet is capable of, uh, capable of temperature regulation too. So uh, in terms of the temperature regulation, the Daisy World model is not fundamentally different from a lifeless planet that has a negative feedback on, uh, to, to uh, re regulate its temperature. So uh, I think uh, to represent the uh, biological effect of uh, in the Daisy World model, we have to uh, add something uh, unique to the uh, uh, to life. So uh, that's uh, the uh, Darwinian uh, evolution. And so uh, here, I'm mainly interested in how natural selection uh, operating on individual organisms can lead to evolution of planetary scale uh, homeostasis. And uh, I, uh, to do that, I would add uh, one term to represent the genetic load uh, to the uh, population e e uh, e equation. And also, uh, I would like the uh, albedo to undergo directional selection. Uh, here, I would fix uh, the optimum growth temperature uh, and uh, only consider the evolution of daisy albedo. Uh, 
And uh, now uh, we, uh, so here, uh, the, uh, here the, this term V is the uh, genetic variance uh, of each daisy species. And it's a free parameter in the model. And uh, we would consider several cases with uh, d different uh, genetic variants. And first, uh, for, a genet for the a genet genetic variance of uh, 10 to the minus 4, uh, we have something like this. Uh, so a lot is going on here. So uh, from top to bottom, it shows the fashion of the uh, daisy world covered by daisies. Uh, shows the uh, albedo of each daisy species represented by the gray lines. And also the black lines re represent the global mean albedo. Uh, this is for the uh, optimum growth temperature and it uh, stays uh, fixed uh, for all simulations. Uh, the bottom is the temperature of the, the black line is the temperature of the planet uh, and uh, each streak uh, represent uh, the trajectory of each daisy species. And we can see uh, that it uh, introduction of evolution to the daisy world model has not uh, greatly changed the uh, features here that uh, the lifespan of the daisy world is similar to the case uh, without uh, evolution. And, uh, and more interesting is this, uh, that this case has a lower uh, genetic variance and uh, uh, when you first uh, brighten the, the sun, and uh, you can see uh, from here the uh, white, uh, uh, no, uh, the light color, the da daisy species would uh, tend to change its color to a darker one. And, uh, but uh, at some point, uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, when the temperature has reached its uh, optimum growth temperature, that would be a positive feedback. Uh, that would cause the uh, the tem temperature to uh, run away. And in, in this case, the uh, rate of evolution ha it cannot keep up with the change in the environmental temperature and uh, suddenly the daisy world came to an end. And, uh, but uh, if the genetic variance is higher, like uh, shown here, then the, uh, at any uh, point of, of time, the daisy species can keep up with the change in the so solar flux. And actually the two species uh, became one earlier in the simulation, so that they, they, uh, their uh, beetles all change to, a, uh, to, some, some, to uh, some value that would favor the uh, growth of each uh, species. And, uh, and right now, it seems that the model is quite determined that uh, I would like to, to introduce uh, some uh, randomness to the model. So uh, I would uh, randomly see the a new daisy species every 10 uh, steps in the simulation. And uh, the genetic variance of each species would be selected from a range uh, as shown here. Uh, and uh, also the albedo of any new daisy species would uh, fall into uh, a zero, uh, uh, into 0 0.25 and 0 0.75. Uh, uh, but uh, I, the newly uh, seeded uh, species may or may not survive and it depends on what, whether it can grow. And the sp species is considered extinct uh, when its spatial coverage has fallen uh, below uh, one in uh, 10,000. 
And uh, robustness of uh, these simulation can be evaluated by the uh, multi-simulation uh, ensemble. And uh, as in this case, uh, this case with uh, a intermediate uh, genetic variance. And uh, we can see that, uh, uh, so species come and, and go in this simulation, but uh, and here, also, uh, each street would uh, re represent represent the trajectory of one daisy species. Um, an interesting thing is that uh, over time, uh, species with a lower genetic variance would be favored, as shown here. And uh, similar to the previous uh, simulations, uh, the uh, in this uh, simulation, the genetic variance is uh, much lower, and that we can consider this case to be the uh, slow uh, evolution or the fast uh, environmental change case. And uh, we can see that the, uh, each daisy species can, can change uh, the color, but it cannot keep up with the, uh, the change rate in albedo uh, to be uh, optimal for the uh, growth. And, and the, in the case of the fast evolution or the slow environmental change, and uh, we, we can see that uh, the evolution uh, Evolution ha happens re really fast, and uh, all daisy uh, species would uh, converge to a single tra trajectory. And so the robustness of those simulation is tested in the 30-member uh, ensemble, as shown here. And although uh, there is some uh, uh, ra random process in the model, but uh, we see that the, uh, in terms of the uh, lifespan of the biosphere, the fate of the daisy world is uh, quite sealed. So there, the spread of, uh, uh, um, between the simulations is actually quite small, so that uh, there is not much uh, randomness at play here. And uh, in the case with uh, a lar larger uh, genetic variance, we see something similar here. Uh, but an interesting case is uh, the case that uh, evolution can happen, but it happens slowly. That uh, to predict uh, where, when the daisy world would end, uh, you would need a, a much luck. So that we see that the spread over the time, uh, over the terminating uh, solar flux uh, varies widely uh, between those simulations. So that uh, chances, chance seems to play a major role here. Uh, so to conclude, uh, the uh, capability of evolution may or may not prolong the resilience of the biosphere to uh, change it in the environment. And uh, when evolution happens fast uh, or the environment uh, changes slowly, uh, it may prolong the lifespan of the biosphere. But uh, we remember that the, uh, to uh, speed up evolution, you would need a large uh, genetic variance. And, and it comes at a cost on the maximum fitness when the uh, environment is, is just right for the optimum growth. And uh, when the evolution cannot keep up with the uh, change in the environment, uh, evolution can, I, can actually shorten the lifespan of the biosphere. And uh, uh, at last, uh, my appreciation goes to Paul for Kowski, Bob Cobb for supporting my work here. And I uh, also thank uh, Juan uh, for many helpful discussions. Thank you.
questions? Yes. Life in ocean can have any effect on the planetary. Um, uh, first, I'm not, I, I, I don't think um, life in ocean can have um, this much e effect on the global mean temperature because it cannot significantly change the albedo of the ocean surface. And, uh, uh, but I think a life in ocean can, uh, in terms of the carbon cycle, it can uh, re regulate the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And uh, that could uh, potentially provide a negative feedback to stabilize the planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 